So I, I, I wanted to talk about sustainability, safety. Uh, I didn't think it would be appropriate to talk about construction management and not at least touch on those issues. You know, this isn't a safety class per se, but if we didn't, Lamont talked about they're having a, you know, a day or days dedicated to safety. So the idea is not, uh, so when we talk about sustainability is not to, to find out how do we achieve LEED uh, certification or in safety, not how do you get to be 10 hour OSHA certified or how do you, what's the correct way to inspect scaffolding or that, that's not the idea. Um, it's more of a global perspective. Why do owners care about sustainability and why should that matter to you, right? So if you know why an owner cares, then you can, again, going back to, if you know why an owner cares, why a general contractor cares, if you're the, so if you're the GC, acting as a GC, you know why the owner cares, you can find how you fit in there. If you're acting as a sub, you know why the GC and owner care, you can find how do you fit into this puzzle here. So um, that's kind of the idea, and then, some cost control cost control type stuff but before I forget I wanted to I didn't get uh, I, I wouldn't even say a majority of the material but s enough to where I feel I should owe this guy his due um, this is a great book on um, project management it's at the very end um, JF McCarthy um, it's it's great it it's talks about everything and some things in very big picture type stuff and then gets down to a lot of detail. So if you're looking for a book on project management just to have on the shelf at, at the office, this is a this is a great one. And it's at, at the very end, so if you want to reference it. Um, so sustainable. So let's, and this, the next two, I kind of want to get as much feedback, input, participation from everyone uh, as much as we can. So tell me, what what is sustainability? What, what does sustainability mean? Um, yeah. So we use this. Uh, yeah, we use the term sustainability. So how does it kind of used in modern jargon? Not to use all resources or right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. conservation. You know, the reuse, reduce, recycle mantra. Right. Mm -hmm. And but really, what it means is something that sustains so if something is sustainable it will go on and on and on forever but how do we get to that well we reduce reduce it's like we'll make sure we don't cut down all the trees right because then there's no more trees right so or whatever the case may be so we we apply the term sustainability to practices but really what we're doing is we're trying to achieve sustainability we're trying to uh not just on a building or on a on a one project, but kind of as a as a culture, as a society, we want to create a sustainable society. Um, but we apply it very specifically. Oh, this is a sustainable project. Well, that's kind of a weird way to describe a, a McDonald's, right? You know, uh, you know, but we describe it that way. You know, it. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, yeah, <laughs> right. Yes, a Big Mac in some form or fashion will stay with you forever, uh, whether you want it to or not. Um, but or or any building, you know, this building, you know, I don't I don't know the details of of the construction design and construction of this building, but if if it were done with sustainable principles, we would call this a sustainable building. But really, it's built with the hopes of it being part of a sustainable culture. And sustainable society. That's kind of what we mean by sustainability. Green, you'll hear green, green building, sustainable building, all that. LEED, so L-E-E-D, um, is the government um, kind of organization, the, the stamp they put on. The we, this is considered certified, or this is certified um, sustainable or green. So that's kind of, so when you see LEED, L-E-E-D, that's what that means. So, Sustainability at the pre-construction phase. So I, I could have also said at the construction management phase, but pre-con fit better. Um, so again, it's it's really a, a big picture idea, but w if we just zoom in on the pre-construction phase of, of the construction project, um, what is the construction manager's role? Any ideas? So during during pre-con, 
what, what would the construction manager's role be? It's really to assist in identifying project certification goals. Okay, so some of the things you can, uh, that will help a project be more sustainable would be, for example, um, enabling people that, whether they work in that building or live in that building, if it's an apartment complex or whatever that building is used for. So let's just say they work there, it's an office building. Enabling them to bike to work, right? If they're able to bike to work, they don't have to drive, fewer cars on the road, all the benefits of that. But if you don't have a bike rack, you're going to have some way for them to lock, somewhere to put their bike, but it's not very conducive to that. So one thing that you kind of get, it, and if, if we're looking at lead, you get a lead point for having a bike rack. But you can't just have a bike rack. You have to have to, have to have a place for the, the bike to workers to, to shower, to provide a shower, uh, so a restroom with shower facilities. Okay, that's, it's, that's a great thing. I mean, I, I, I honestly think that's, a, that's an awesome thing for buildings to have, but what if it's a high-end hotel? Okay, you don't have to provide, obviously your guests are going to have a place to shower, right? But to get that, to really kind of engender the whole idea of sustainability, making, if we're looking at that, real narrow, you know, the bike to work, keeping cars off the road, people bike. Well, all your staff would be the ones biking, not all, but a portion of your staff would be the ones biking to work. So you've got to put public showers, okay? Does a really high-end hotel want public showers? Probably not. Right, so you've got to, uh, uh, the reason I give that example is you've got to identify sp certification goals specific to that project. So one thing that some contractors will do, uh, and it's really not a good idea, is just go down the list of what, what are some, what's a checklist of ways I can be sustainable and just pick off the cheapest ones. Well, you're going to be putting restrooms in anyways. So, well, I'll just put in a shower and put out a, put in a bike rack and for a thousand bucks I got a check mark you know or, or whatever the case may be there so if I do this little thing then it check but does that really fit in the um, in the goals of the project is that an appropriate way to do lots of buildings providing a bike rack and shower facilities fits great in the goals of the project for the yeah it depends on what the owner wants so yeah yeah. Not really care right. Not the right. Is worth the yes, and identifying owner goals is a big one. It's a big uh, bullet point of this. So a lot of uh, I read recently that the GSA is moving toward requiring lead certification yes. on their vertical yes. construction projects. Right. So it's it's not really going to be a choice anymore. Government contractors will have to learn right. how to build those into their prices right. and their price schedules. But, and I haven't read anything about that w moving its way into horizontal construction. Which is weird. Uh, which yes. Is, uh, which I thought was weird. Yeah. So I was wondering, you know, why, why that may happen. Because GSA is really mm -hmm. gearing up. Right. And a lot of smaller municipalities, so the city of Dallas, for example, if you're going to do a project that's, so a, a police... So well, okay, it's compared to the federal government. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> um, small, small ish, small er, maybe. Um, so, if you're going to do a project for the city of Dallas, then it's going to be at least, I, I think it's LEED Silver now. Uh, it, it, first, it was just LEED certified, so the, the lowest one. I think they're moving up. Um, some cities are LEED Platinum. Uh, there's a, well, we'll get into it. There was a city in Kansas that was pretty well destroyed by uh, a tornado several years back, and they said, "Okay, we have a chance to kind of decide wh how we want the what we want the kind of trajectory of the city to be." Everything's lead platinum, so they they were forced with a do-over, but they said, well, "Let's make the best of it. This is going to kind of be our thing. Everything in th in town is lead platinum." So. But, yes, so municipalities are requiring it, and then GSA is working that direction. I don't know the answer to why vertical construction, or rather horizontal construction, is not that way. I, I don't know the answer, because there seemed to be a lot of opportunity for getting regional materials and uh, 
recycling waste and I, I I don't know the answer to that I don't know the answer um I don't know if it's political or if maybe the the cost benefit just isn't there and and maybe going I don't know I don't know I really don't know the answer but but you bring up a good point yes there are government agencies that are just going to require this and sometimes they leave it up to you like you were saying Chris it's just it's up to the design team to figure out how to get there the owner wants lead silver or lead platinum I just got to do everything I can do to get there uh, and maybe a high-end hotel they want to flaunt they want to put that public restroom out there so people can see it because hey look we're encouraging everyone to bike to work and because this fits in our overall kind of corporate culture of we're a green company or we're, we promote sustainability. So maybe that's the, the ideal thing to, to kind of put those little elements to showcase the bike rack, you know, and saying and put a little plaque saying this is why we have a bike rack. So if that fits in the corporate culture and their goals as a company, maybe that's what maybe they want that to be behind the scenes and they don't want to flaunt it. So maybe a bike to work and and shower facilities don't fit in there but the whole I idea is identify what those project goals are project certification goals are and then find out how, how they fit in and the reason all of us in this room should care about that is whatever piece you're bringing to the project whether you're designing the whole thing or you're do you're building the whole thing or building a part of it um, sustainability touches everything so if you can provide, uh, so what's what's a real common material you provide, or you, you purchase and then install? Concrete. Concrete. Okay, so so if you can provide, so concrete and rebar. Okay, if if you can just upfront say, hey, I get all my rebar from this plant, and they use 85% recycled materials. If you just have that document kind of in your back pocket to use whenever you need to, you're now that's that's a very common one that most people will have so that's probably not the one but if you could find one another one that that material that may not be as common or if you can just prove hey I've got all the documentation include include a line in your bid I use all recycle or my product is a uh, 95% recycled materials my concrete I get that from Delisi who has a, a plant or a gravel pit or a quarry or whatever you're you know uh, certain miles away so it's within the rule is uh, is 500 miles to be considered regional, 500 mile radius. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, no, but yeah, right. But when you're in, yeah, when you're in San Angelo, Texas, and 500 miles is is not that far. You, you just it's a stretch to get it. What who gets hosed is like Los Angeles, because you know we we get 500 miles everywhere, Los Angeles they're not going to be buying gravel from the Pacific Ocean so they only get they only get half that circle but uh that's just part of that's just part of the game which is I, I suspect that's why they increased it to 500 miles to kind of offset some of that downside that we just are lucky recipients of that but another thing you can do to be more sustainable say oh we we beat that so you know of the of all the brick manufacturers in the country, uh, I think 75% of them are within a uh, hundred miles of Oklahoma city because there's a lot of uh, great soil, clay soil for, for brick. Right? So if you can say, if you're a Mason and you say, Hey, I, you've got paperwork saying this is where all my materials are coming from. I know the requirement is 500 miles, but mine are 75 miles away. And the owner can take that to, they can actually get more, points towards their certification now it's subject to approval on a case-by-case -case basis but if you can say we far exceed requirements you get what's called an innovation point and you can get an extra point for that towards your your kind of your seal of approval for certification your your lead certification so if you can provide documentation that says one hey i meet the requirements or Hey, I far exceed them. I bet you could get an innovation point for that. Um, that just makes you more valuable as a as a general contractor or as a subcontractor. Uh, so, credit feasibility analysis would be another big one. Maybe 
getting regional materials or getting a material that's used recycled materials in the production of that. So when we say recycled ma materials for rebar, that doesn't mean the rebar was pulled out of some demoed concrete and reused. What that means was they went to a metal scrap yard, melted it down and, and produced some, yeah. So that just means that rebar was made out of stuff that, you know, it, it used to be a Coke can or whatever. It used to be a steel building that was demolished or whatever, whatever it used to be in a previous life. Um, it is recycled, right? So, but maybe there's some other stuff that, yeah, you can get it recycled, but it's going to cost you triple. Or you can get it recycled materials, but uh, it's going to take six months to get, and we could get the, new s the stuff that's not in a week. Or maybe it just doesn't fit, again, fit within the goals. Uh, but identifying, so is it really feasible to get it? And is it, uh, is it cost effective to get it? Um, and it doesn't, I mean, I'm using recycled materials as an example. There's a lot more than that. You know, it could be the refrigerant in an, in an air conditioning system. You know, maybe you say, yeah, this is more environmentally friendly, but it's not as efficient. And so you have to run it more often. So you're using more electricity. So you're really not getting the benefit. So when you got to pay to run your AC more often and you're kind of using fuel anyway. So now that that actually literally did used to be a problem. Hey, we've got this green refrigerant for AC systems, but it doesn't work very well and you got to run your AC all day long. So it's not so much that way anymore, but when they first came out, that was kind of a problem. And as more sustainable innovations come along, that's kind of the, the, the path that doesn't work well at first and then we kind of figure out how it works. And um, so that's, that's part of the, the process there. Uh, and then another uh, feasibility analysis would be how does it affect the schedule? So like I said, if, it, if it's going to take six months to get it, whereas an alternative that you don't get a point for would take a week, you have to balance that out. Maybe you don't need it for six months and you get it. Well, maybe you need it in, in one month and you, you don't get it. So uh, availability of products and services, same, same idea. Uh, assessing certifiability. So... That's three main main questions. One, can we get this credit? <laughs> really simple. So if you're going down the checklist, can we get this credit? Um, so not so much in how do we get it, but can we get it? Some of them are, you have to re, uh, uh, you get a point for renovating. So re renovating a building. Well, if this is ground up, we can't even get it. We're not even going to look at that. Uh, maybe you could decide between doing partial demo and renovation and complete demo and ground up. So some of them are, it's brownfield redevelopment. We're not doing brownfield <laughs> redevelopment. We can't get it. Uh, how many points is it worth? And how much does it cost? So in an ideal world, we wouldn't care about the cost. We're going to do what's most uh, sustainable for so the environment and kind of society at large. In reality, we, we got to pay for it, right? So if we go broke halfway through the project, then that's definitely not sustainable. You got to you got a half-built bridge that doesn't do any, anybody any good at all. So, um, so we do have to consider cost, right? So, and let me let me go back to that. So, <coughs> why should you care about these things? Why do you care about how many points it's worth, but especially how much does it cost? This is a great way to differentiate differentiate yourself to set yourself apart is to, to know, ideally know off the top of your head, uh, but it's hard to just know off the top of your head because things, things change. But at least to quickly go back to the office, make put together an estimate to say, here's what it's going to cost per plans and specs. Here's what it's going to cost to get the, these, whatever these, you know, we identified as these lead points that we can get, whatever these are, um, that apply to you, how much does it cost? Now the perception is that it's always an upcharge, and we'll show you a little example of why that's not always the case, but especially if you can say, hey, this doesn't increase my cost at all, and let me use these al uh, alternate materials, and you get lead points for them, or you get they're sustainable, uh, and it's no increased cost, I mean, that's great. That do doesn't always work, and you can't always help that. But if you have an idea of the cost 
and, and you can bring that to a table at a pre-construction meeting or design meeting, that is extremely valuable and will set you apart. If you can provide not only you know, constructability reviews during design, but uh, sustainability kind of concepts. And we can do these things and it's no extra cost. We can do these extra things and it's a 3% premium or whatever. If you can identify what those things are and what the cost premium is, that makes you very valuable. You mentioned LEED certification. Mm -hmm. um, who or what entity is responsible for making those determinations? Um, or is it a self-certification? No, it's not. It's the, the U.S. Green Building Council, so USGBC. A pseudo government entity, so they're government agency ish, I guess. Um, so like an NGO. They're kind, yeah, they're kind of an NGO. Yeah, I don't fully understand. I, you know, they kind of put themselves out as, and they don't directly claim this. It's just um, probably just mis uh, misunderstanding on the a lot of the public as as they they seem to be a government agency. Like it's just an arm of of uh, EPA or, or whatever, but it's really not. They're kind of their own thing. Um, but I don't, I don't fully understand how it all works. I know they're not technically a government agency. Their NGO is probably a good way to, d to describe it. I don't know if they fit all the rules of an NGO, but that's more or less how they work. Like ISO certification mm -hmm. that right. That yeah. Right. Like for insurance purposes and yeah. That, right. Uh, Right, right. Like a nice entity do that. Right. You know, I wasn't sure. Yeah. yeah, so the, the U.S. So you do all these things, and then it's like, well, do you just, maybe you pick up the phone and call yeah. and say, I want a grade on my right. you know, project. Right, and that's a, which that's a big part of the cost is, is getting all that documentation. So, mm -hmm. so the USGBC is the one that, that will have the final say and you have a lead certified or you have a lead gold or whatever the whatever tier you met um, and will give you the plaque to put on your building or whatever it is but there it's actually a long process so you you submit them you say I think first you say I think these are the points we're going to get and then they'll come back it's it's actually a pretty good process it didn't used to be all that great but I, as the kinks are worked out it's getting to be pretty good I think we can get these points and they'll respond based on the description of your project. There's no way you're getting these three, but the rest you can, we think you'll probably get if you, if you do what you say you're going to do. Oh. So that gives you the chance to say, oh no, I lost these three points. You didn't lose them because you never had them, but I lost these three points. Um, what can I do to, to make up for that? <coughs> so that's a great, it's a great service they offer um, as far as before you start and then you're stuck with a completed facility that you go oh shoot I thought I was going to get that point and now I now I've got 59 points and I needed 60 and 59 points is nothing right so or whatever depending on the tier you're going for so it's the USGBC that does it all but there is a pretty well defined um, process for applying so you apply I think we can get these they respond you send Sometimes you can send things as the project's going. Usually you just wait to the end and send them a big packet. These are all the things we did. You know, re we recycled a certain percentage of our material. Here's all the tickets from the recycling plant that says how much we recycled and that kind of stuff. And so they'll review it. And, uh, and sometimes you send a mountain of paperwork. I don't know how they get through it, but they do. <laughs> yes, sir. Right. And all I've done is horizontal. Right. So it's good to, to hash things out. And, you know, lead just doesn't play a, a role in our world. On the right. Side. Do you see, you know, as somebody who's on the forefront of the industry, that ever happen? The previous I owner tried to institute, <coughs> you know, on the job recycling and get the contract to, right. to throw the tin cans in a recycle bin yeah. as opposed to a dumpster, 30 yard roll off. And it was a blithering mess. Yeah. I right. love them for trying, but they right. made money in the B because it requires somebody to monitor it, right? Oversight. Yeah, you've got a, you have to have a dumpster diver. Yeah, yeah. and, and <laughs> as inspectors, we were to a certain extent. And <laughs> yeah. It was impossible. You would yeah. have had to have 50 people covering yeah. a five-mile job yeah. to pick up tin cans. Right. So, but what they 
they wanted to do, this was a, a regional mobility authority, not a department of transportation. So somebody who, who I don't know, had a different, different interest in, in saying we're better than, then DOT is not necessarily compete, but RMA, sure. at least in Texas, want to say I'm better than this one. Right. There's seven of them in Texas. Right. And so they wanted to say, okay, we're going green. We're being sustainable. Yeah. The Fort Worth office is better than the, yeah. Said, how the heck do we do that? Yeah. And it, it's very, very challenging. Right. So to summarize the question, it was, uh, will these s sustainability concepts that are in, uh, that are common in, in vertical construction become more common in horizontal construction. And I, I don't know that it will be, well, the answer is I don't know, <laughs> really, to be quite honest. But what I think, I don't think it will be lead, at least not anytime soon, but there are other ones. Um, Green Globes is one. Uh, there's, there's some other ones that aren't lead, but they're certifications you can get that are the same concept that may be more applicable to horizontal construction. The, uh, yeah, that recycling, I, I, don't, I don't know how you monitor recycling over, uh, I mean, it's, it's hard enough when yeah. it's just on, you know, a one acre site, <laughs> I don't know how you, but um, I think that it will move that direction as, so I grew up in Dallas, let's just use Dallas as an example, all right. Uh, Dallas is basically, DFW is basically two big cities with a million suburbs filling in the gaps. Okay, well, Allen or Plano doesn't get your taxes if you live in Dallas or if you live in Richardson. Or so how can they attract? Well, they've got to they've distinguish themselves somehow. So, And I'm not saying that they're doing this. I'm just as a theoretical example. Um, well, maybe one way they could distinguish themselves. So maybe there's a new suburb that's kind of starting to grow. They can say, hey, we're, we are very sustainable. And look, look at those bridges we have in these new developments. They, they met these criteria and we only do. Now, I, I, yeah, if it's TxDOT running a road through, they don't have much control over it. But say so the work they do have control over, we, we only do these things. So if that were to expand to a larger market and Oklahoma could market itself as, well, all our new construction meets, you know, X, Y, Z uh, standards. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. If you want it, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. And that's what they're doing. And once you're tied to a revenue stream, mm -hmm. you're tied right. to their rules. Exactly right. And, and that's exactly right. Your money, you can do what you want, but it's not. Yeah. Well, right. And the, how, how often have you right. seen ethical behavior um, mandated financially by mm -hmm. governor's requirements? Mm -hmm. The DBE program is a perfect example of yeah. that. The city of Dallas is one of the few metropolitan areas that actually has minority business mm -hmm. programs in right. place. And so, so you can see where the, the money pushes social change. Mm -hmm. and, and I see it in vertical construction, and I <coughs> just wonder how long the gap is going to be before it creeps into Right. And, and that's kind of what I would guess will be the catalyst is – if the G, like you were talking about earlier, if the GSA develops standards for vertical construction and it's successful, maybe they'll say, oh, you want some of this highway funding, we need you to implement you know, if whatever. If the GSA does it, if the Army Corps of Engineers is looking at it, you right. know they are. Oh, yeah. And if they are, it's, I mean, it's, it's just going to. Right. So the last Corps of Engineers project I worked on, we lead wasn't required, but we called it a betterment. So it's something that kind of enhanced our proposal. Um, so yeah, if maybe that will be considered uh, a betterment to horizontal construction, you, you've got to meet the minimum qualifications, right? You got to show that you're competent, you know what you're doing. But if you can say as a kind of, these are the betterments, these are the added, bo added bonus, we can achieve all these 
sustainability requirements, whether it's LEED or Green Globes or whatever, maybe the federal government sets up their own, mm -hmm. then they will weigh preferences. Th they will they will weigh as when they compare the, the proposals, they will add weight to that. And I think that's probably how it will play out is that the federal government will say, you need to give preference to ones that are doing it this way. They may not say, you have to do it this way, but this is going to weigh more heavily if I mean you do we that. We have seen some changes in horizontal construction, right? Environmental barriers, right. More, um, more attention to runoff water, uh, uh, some, some changes yeah. creeping in. But yeah. Quite sweeping change. I mean, the, you, you, you hit the nail on the head as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. It's tied to a revenue stream. That's right. Yeah. And almost every yeah. project I've ever worked on mm -hmm. had at least a, one federal dollar. Mm -hmm. You had a bag of rules. <laughs> That's right. And yeah. if some of those rules are, hey, we need to you know, reduce our greenhouse the gas emissions right. through our cement R right. procurement you know, process. You right. CNG R trucks. Yeah. To, yeah. But uh, so I, I just think that, that companies that are prepared mm -hmm. to or and are moving that way on their own are going to have better access mm -hmm. to you. That's right. So if you're if you're practicing these principles now, mm -hmm. when they become required it will be a less uh, harsh adjustment. Exactly. Right, yeah. right. Uh, you know, that's a big thing. Um, I mean, small things like the wood for cabinets, okay? There's a certain protocol to prove that uh, it came from a, a forest that is managed, is forest, stu forest Stewardship Council, which is great, and we should be taking care of our forest. So this is this is something we should be doing anyway, right? But um, th it was, <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, o oxygen <laughs> is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to make a big statement, but yeah. we all like oxygen, right? Yeah. So, um, but it was so hard to get that piece of paper that said, yes, this came from a forest that is managed by a, you know, FSC approved group or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was so painful just to get that. But a few owners pushed it. A few mus municipalities pushed it. We're using all FSC certified wood. And you know what? Now it's not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You just tell them I need FSC wood. Some, depending on what it, the specifics it is, it may cost a few extra bucks, but it's not that big a deal anymore. And you just you get it. But now. Right. They know the drill. The yeah. I remember the first time I called, the vendor said, oh, that's going to at least triple your cost. I'm saying, it's the exact same sheet of plywood that I would get over here, it just doesn't have that people, oh, I, but I don't know how to get it, I don't know how to get it. Mm -hmm. And he was just trying to, he, he was afraid that it was gonna cost him a bunch more money, so he was just running, jacking up the cost, which, yeah, exactly. So, I think it will take a few people fighting through it, and like, like you said, if you're doing these now, while you don't necessarily have to, but you can kind of pick and choose, well, I'm only gonna use vendors that use natural gas in their trucks or whatever, or, or we're gonna substitute fly it and so as a designer here we're going to substitute fly ash for cement which you probably do that all the time anyway but um you know there's maybe other nuances um to that we're going to try these alternative materials so then when it's thrust upon you you're going to use fly ash um you kind of know the the nuances of doing the design um thanks for the discussion yeah no I any more questions you have like that i don't off topic i'll i'll chase rabbits down the hall all day long okay. Um, so why do owners go green? Financial motivation. Um, sometimes it's cheaper to have an energy efficient building. Usually it's cheaper to have an energy efficient building, right? If we do it right, it's going to be cheaper. So there could just be, they don't care about the, the goodwill. They, they just want to run their, their building or whatever they're doing more efficiently. Right? Um, so it reduce operating costs. Um, and it's not just how long does the AC run? It's more than that. You know, having lighting, appropriate levels of lighting increase occupant productivity, which increases the owner's bottom line and all that. So it's more than just are you using less electricity. Um, and so if, so if it's an owner, again, back to, to vertical construction, if it's an owner leasing out space, if they can prove that it's cheaper to operate, more productive, they can charge more money to rent out that space. Uh, government incentives, um, some owners will get tax incentives to, to if they achieve certain levels of sustainability. 
market positioning, and this is, this is probably the biggest one, at least among lead certifications, is uh, you've got a plaque on your building and you can point to it. You can put it on your brochures. You can, if you have a commercial on the radio, you can say, we are have a lead platinum certified building or whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a marketing thing, which is, hey, what, if that's what's causing people to go green, then great. A um, couple other things, social commitment. Some owners really do just want to do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. But it's important to know, oh, I think they've got one more. Municipality requirement, like we talked about. Um, it's important to know why, what the owner's motivation is. If it's financial motivation, then you better come to the table with a cost increase or cost decrease, and not just the cost to install, but the cost to operate long term. So using fly ash to replace some of the cement and concrete is not going to reduce the cost to operate. At least, I don't know, maybe I can't think of a reason it would. But it may affect a front cost, property. right? <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't do it. It shouldn't have any impact on it, yeah, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, if you use all fly ash, then <laughs> right, it would be a problem. Yeah, but uh, yeah, if it's done right, it shouldn't. But some, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, I guess there is no operation cost because you're not going to have a building anymore. You're not going to have a road anymore. Um, but it's good to know what the motivations are. If they, if it's a tax incentive, then really what you should bring to the table is we're going to do this, and here's the tax incentive behind it. Or if it's a social commitment, this is what you can do, and this is why the public cares about it. Yeah, so you, sh it's important to know to the extent you can what is the owner's or the contractor's motivation for going green, for doing sustainable work, because that's going to that's going to color how you approach uh, proposals or change orders or design input. So why not go green? Administrative costs, and Katrina, this is kind of what we were talking about a second ago. It's so it's okay if you spend a little more money on a more efficient uh, water heater, let's just say, something simple. But what a lot of people have a hang-up on, and I am one of them, is I have to spend more money to prove I have a better water heater. But if I get a better water heater and it's going to cost me less to run, that, great. But if I have to spend money just to prove that I have it, there's something that seems weird about that. Right? So, okay, expand that to a large project. Okay, I have to prove that all the aggregate in my concrete came from within a certain radius. Okay? It's great that we're doing it, reducing uh, emissions and all kinds of benefits to me a local economy and all, all those great benefits but to prove that we had to do it a lot of people get hung up on that um, and I understand now it's getting much better more streamlined it's not nearly like it used to be uh, I worked on my first lead project in 05 06 maybe and it was it was so many of the costs went to this it's not nearly as bad as it used to be but there still are some um, so compiling the documentation. Y if you're going to prove that you recycled your waste, if you ha so I know when I would recycle, uh, say steel for example, or well, concrete was the most most common one. So spoils, uh, washout and stuff, thrown into the concrete dumpster. If there was a two by four in there, they didn't give you the opportunity to go in there and clean it out. They just said take it to the landfill. They wouldn't. They wouldn't give you the opportunity. If it showed up at the recycling plant to, the, to crush it into gravel or aggregate or whatever, they see a two by four or half a sheet of drywall go to the landfill because they're not going to spend the time. And why should they? That's we should be responsible to keep it clean to send them only concrete spoils. But if we don't, right? Yes, right. They probably could, but then they're going to send you a bill for it, which. If I'm going to pay, I'm going to pay my own guys to do it. Um, at least maybe I can control the cost a little bit. But what does that mean you have to do? You have to send the engineer to be a dumpster diver, right, or, or hire someone. So um, 
Commissioning and modeling costs, so a, a lot of them are related to costs, so commissioning, uh, we won't get into commissioning. Basically, commissioning is, in its essence, is proving that the building does what it's supposed to do. Uh, but you've got to spend money to, to prove it. Um, you've got to model it up front to say this is what it's going to do and this is why we're designing it, uh, but we won't go into all that. Uh, design and construction costs, you know, if you're going to, if you were wanting to hire a design and construction team, you narrow your field of who you can choose from. So you're, as a natural result, you're going to increase the cost a lot of times. So one way you can set yourself apart, hey, I have, I have knowledge and expertise in sustainable construction, and my price is just as good as the next guy's. So if you can prove that you're just as good as the next guy, uh, or you're, you're just as um, competitive, price competitive as the next guy, but you're, you have expertise in this area, uh, it's very, very advantageous. Um, some materials and systems are more expensive. Uh, again, site overhead, construction waste management. Um, I actually saw a line item in a budget one time uh, that <laughs> had a line item for dumpster diver. But <laughs> 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 um, uh, indoor air quality management. Um, so really the, the, the gist is non-value added items. So paying someone to go through and separate the trash from recycling, you're not adding value to the project. You're not giving the end user any added value. But they're having to pay for it, or someone's having to pay for it. Um, so you know, having a, a more efficient system, that is adding value separating trash that wasn't supposed to be put in the recycling container, that's not adding value. That's just a pain in the butt. Okay, assessing the cost, and we'll go through these pretty quickly because we're short on time, but, um, you know, we're just going to skip right over it now that I say it. So, uh, the, the gist of it is, um, if you are familiar with what the costs are and you can bring that to the table and you're up front with it, that will set you apart. Um, I, I thought this was really interesting. So here's a study. Um, these are all academic buildings. So it's cost per square foot. And so it's sort of color coded. Um, so just the light gray is not certified. The green is certified, which is the lowest level of lead. The dark gray uh, is silver and then the yellow or gold that's gold certified there's no platinums on here um, so those are kind of the tiers of, of certification you can get so if it were all cost driven so you you pay more you get a higher level of certification we would expect to see all the light grays down here in the you know two hundred dollars a square foot range and then grow to some to some uh, greens and then dark grays and golds but you see that's not the case at all there's no logical pattern. Uh, the three highest ones are not certified. You know, and one of the lowest ones is gold. There's no pattern at all. So strong evidence, and I know this is only one study and it was, uh, it was quite a few buildings, but um, it's getting pretty good, pretty good sample size. But uh, there's, Evidence against you just buy certification. You don't just buy certification. And that's a good thing. We don't want it to be that way. You know, we want it to, otherwise they don't need us construction managers, right? Then they can just buy points. They don't need people with expertise. Um, so the, okay, th so the n kind of name of the study, cost of green revisited, higher quality and higher costs, you know, to trying to see if quality has defined the level of certification of the tier. Um, So even within this same, and this is just one kind of snapshot of his study, uh, within the same building category, there's a large variation. What he found was the cost differences were not primarily due to the level or the tier of certification, but the program and the general owner goals. So not level of lead, but what are the overall owner's goals, owner's overall goals um, that drove the cost, so cost per square foot in this case. Uh, so pretty strong evidence against more sustainable or greener equals more expensive. It's not necessarily the case. Um, 
And I've got some examples here that we won't get into, uh, but the uh, big picture idea is <coughs> you don't want to, when you're offering up an idea or a cost, make sure, now it doesn't always apply, but if it does apply, you include a note about lifetime costs. So you may say, so I fall back on, you know, plumbing and mechanical just because those are really easy. We all have an air conditioner in our house, right? So, um, plus I'm not that smart. So, um, so if I get a more efficient air conditioner, and I pay a little bit more for it, but if I know my electric bill is going to be cheaper over time, well, that's okay. So I pay an extra thousand dollars now, but I'm going to save thirty dollars a month in electricity. Okay, well, I'm going to get, I'm going to recuperate my costs, and then I'll start saving money. But if the HVAC contractor just came to say, hey, here's an extra $1,000, and I said, I don't, why would I want to do that? No, give me the cheaper one. So you should, as a contract, whether you're the GC or the sub, always offer up that life cycle cost benefit. So here's the upcharge right now, but it's going to save you this much money over time. You always want to offer up that, that offsetting costs. Now, sometimes it's, here's the same price and it's going to save you money. Or, hey, this is cheaper and it's going to save you money. Especially if it's an upcharge you want to include. Now, like I said, it doesn't always, there's not always an, an impact on life cycle cost. But uh, if there is, you always want to include that as a note. Uh, in whether it's a change order bid or an original bid, you always want to include that as a note. <coughs> Uh, yeah, there's some examples we won't go through, but you're welcome to look at them. Oh, and I left this in on purpose in, in case I wasn't sure if there's going to be any subcontractors in the room or not. Um, that the idea of subcontractor fear. Uh, so, like that example I gave about the FSC wood. Uh, there because was due to fear and it wasn't a sub in that case it was a, a materials vendor but I don't know how to do it. green I hear is more expensive you go green it's more expensive so I'm just going to tack on an extra 15% um, that's not always the case so just get familiar with the actual process don't just freak out ah sustainable I, I don't want to get involved or if I am going to get involved I'm going to increase my price don't make that assumption that it's more uh more costly. Right. 